When you study the hyperbola, you are quickly introduced to the standard forms shown here. There's a 1 on the right-hand side of the equations, and x squared and y squared terms on the other side, and the relative sign between them must be negative. The particular choice of plus minus or minus plus for those square terms will determine the kind of hyperbola you get. In particular, it determines whether the hyperbola crosses the x-axis or the y-axis. The detailed values of a and b will tell you where the axis crossings occur, and also, with a little further study, the equations for the asymptotes, if you want them. Well, that's all well and good, but y equals 1 over x. Your teacher will happily tell you that has a graph that's an hyperbola. y equals 1 over x is nothing like standard form, is it? So how can that be? Let's look at the graph with its equation. Well, I can see what they mean. It could be an hyperbola, couldn't it? It's just that it's tilted round, away from the axes. As for y equals 1 over x, well, we could cross-multiply the x, then we'd have 1 on the right. That's a start towards standard form, isn't it, at least? x, y, though, that's nothing like x squared or y squared, is it? Well, it's not x squared or y squared, but it is a bit like them, in the sense that it's x to the power 1, y to the power 1. The total degree of the variables there is 1 plus 1, so that's a degree 2 term, just like x squared and y squared are. I wonder if we could combine these features, that's the tilting and the degree of the equation, perhaps by introducing some new axes that, that cut across the hyperbola. If we do that and write the equation in terms of the new coordinates, with a bit of luck, perhaps we'll end up with standard form. Well, sure enough, that is how it's going to work. So I'm now going to draw a pair of xy axes in the usual way, and then some tilted axes, x1, y1. I'm not going to draw the hyperbola because that will make the graph a bit cluttered. However, I'm going to mark a point on and give it its coordinates in both axis systems. There we are. At the moment the point's just a little dot. It'll become clearer in a moment. I've given the angle of tilt the name alpha. I'm now going to draw from my point some straight lines to all four axes, so as to mark on the coordinates on those axes. Let's do x, y first. There they are. Now x1, y1. By doing that, we've made ourselves a pair of right angle triangles. The lower one has the angle alpha. That angle alpha can be transferred to the upper one as follows. First of all, in the lower triangle, we can mark in 90 minus alpha. And then vertically opposing that in the upper triangle, another 90 minus alpha. And so finally, at the top of the upper triangle, we can put in the angle alpha. My next task is to put in some side lengths. First of all in the upper triangle. The blue length is just the coordinate length y1. Let's mark that in. The base of the lower triangle has length x. I don't think I need to mark that in again. Now the other sides. I'm just going to give them names. a, b, c and d. So the task I'm aiming for now is to write x and y in terms of x1 and y1. Look at x1. The distance from the origin is the length a plus b. Let's write that down. But then in the lower triangle, x over a would be cos alpha, wouldn't it? So a could be written as x over cos alpha. Well, that's dealt with A. What about B? That's in the upper triangle. We have opposite over adjacent, tan alpha, is B over Y1. So as a result, B equals Y1 tan alpha. Let's put that A and B together back into the X1 at the top. OK, X1 is A plus B. which is x over cos alpha plus y1 tan alpha. I'd like to rewrite this equation now to make x the subject. First of all, we take the y1 tan alpha to the other side. 
here's what we get. Then to make x the subject, all we need to do is multiply through by cos alpha. The first term is easy, and the second term, tan, is sine over cos. Multiplying by cos will cancel the cosines and leave just sine. That gives us the following. That's a very neat equation. It writes our coordinate x in terms of the new coordinates x1 and y1. It's important, so I've put a red box around it. My aim now is to try and do a similar thing for the value y. We'd better go back and look at the picture again. y. That's the red dotted height. We could write that y equals c plus d. So let's now try and do for c and d what we just did for a and b. First of all c. That's in the lower triangle. c over x would be tan alpha. So cross multiplying gives us c equals tan alpha times x. Now d. d is in the upper triangle. We have that cos alpha is y1 over d. Let's write that down. That one can be rearranged for d as d equals y1 over cos alpha. Let's put those two together into y. y is c plus d, so that will be tan alpha x plus y1 over cos alpha. OK, that's our equation for y. Compare it with the red box. It's not quite what we wanted, is it? We would have liked it if that had been x1 there instead of x. But we don't despair because we can substitute for x into this equation. Let's do that now. We get y equals tan alpha times and then we have to substitute all that material for x from the red box. OK, then when we've done that we've got the other term to add on, plus y1 over cos alpha. That has achieved what we want, writing y in terms of x1 and y1. It's just that so far it looks a bit complicated, doesn't it? Let's expand the brackets. First of all, tan times cos. We've seen that before. It's just sine, isn't it, because the cosines cancel. In the other part of the bracket, we've got a y1, and we've got a sine and a tan outside. So that's minus. Now tan is sine over cos, so altogether that's going to be sine squared over cos times the y1 plus the final term. Uh-huh, there's a y1 over cos as a factor. Let's write it that way. There is one lot of y1 over cos, and there's also minus sine squared times that term. Ah, oh, wow, one minus sine squared. That's cos squared, isn't it? That's wonderful. Things are going to simplify. This is going to be the last line, so I'm going to write y again. We've still got sine alpha times x1, and now we've got 1 minus sine squared is cos squared. Cos squared on top, cos underneath leaves just a cos. That's the second red box term that I want. That's my equation for y. OK, so now I'm going to put that together with the one I had for x. And I've done that already on a new page. There they are. Now, back to the hyperbola. Our hyperbola said x times y equals 1. There, I've drawn the hyperbola again as well. Now, what do you think the angle of tilt is? Well, from the equation, or even just from looking at the graph, I think we know that this point is 1, 1. 
This one is negative 1, negative 1. So that angle must actually be 45 degrees, mustn't it? So let's try an angle alpha equals 45. With alpha equals 45, we know the sine and the cosine. In fact, they're both equal and equal to 1 over root 2. So let's put those into our equations. So now our red boxed relations look like this. We can now try multiplying x times y. That's 1 over root 2 x1 minus y1 1 over root 2 x1 plus y1. The 1 over root 2's become a half and the x and y terms are just, well that's the difference of two squares formula isn't it? So it's x1 squared minus y1 squared. So, finally, x, y equals 1 has become a half x, 1 squared minus y, 1 squared equals 1. Or, to make it look more familiar still, x, 1 squared over 2 minus y, 1 squared over 2 equals 1. And, sure enough, that is the equation of an hyperbola in the x, 1, y1 axes and it's a hyperbola this way round with root 2 being the distance from the origin that's consistent with this hypotenuse being root 2 so that's worked very nicely and if we want to relate this to our old xy axes then actually they would be looking like the xy axis here and our x1 y1 look like this. So I hope I've now convinced you that xy equals 1 really isn't hyperbola, it's just a bit disguised.